So kids in school used to make fun of my name, Shasta. And I'd imagine that that's something I have in common with plenty of you in the audience, yeah? I don't imagine that being teased is an experience which is unique to people with unique names. Because as far as I've seen, people are equally capable of making the wrong decision as we are empowered to make the right decision. And this is a theme that we're going to brush up against over and over in my presentation because I want to talk to you about the history of science. Specifically, the history of my branch of science, which is taxonomy. And taxonomy is the science of naming things. Now, I've also observed how people view scientists as just a breed all of our own. Eccentric white men in white coats. And that is not entirely untrue. But scientists are a product of the society which create us. And so that stereotype is actually due to the very humanity of science. For example, in 1753, when Carl Linnaeus was devising his binomial system of naming plants and animals, Education was for wealthy European boys, and so they did grow into those white men with white hair. Now, that binomial system is the one that taxonomy still rests on today, and I know that you have heard and probably even said some of these binomials. In fact, you even have one yourselves, homo sapiens. Or how about boa constrictor, ratus, ratus? or Tyrannosaurus rex. These are binomials. And there is some taxonomic code on screen that I want to teach you to interpret today. So those two names are the genus followed by the species. Genus is always capitalized. Species never is. Together, the two are in italics, and this tells us that we are looking at a species name. They're also followed by what's called the naming authority the name of the scientist, and the year that that description and the name was published. Now, all of this formatting and much, much more is all summed up and bound into the big taxonomic rulebook, the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature. Now, I'm in a position to be naming species because I'm also an entomologist, and insects are the single least well-named group of animals on the planet. Consider, in the 250 years since Linnaeus started writing the Big Book of Rules, 90% of mammals have been given species names, compared to only 20% of insects. Which is why I can confidently tell you that naming an insect is exactly like having sex. Yes, it's very gratifying, but it's not actually all that uncommon. Now, I started practicing taxonomy when I attended a three-month internship at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. And getting ready to go away on this trip, everyone wanted to know, was I going to name a species after myself? And you can bet that the Big Book of Rules has more than a few things to say about that. So firstly, the genus is usually already established. And so you have no say over that part. In DC, I was working on a group called Hippoptera. These are little fingernail-sized beetles which come down out of the canopy of the Amazon rainforest. Secondly, the book says that it's actually kind of frowned upon to name a whole bunch of species after oneself. It's kind of like taxonomically tacky. Bigger yet than my image in taxonomy, the question at the forefront of my mind was, which one is which? <laughs> the humbling reality that I couldn't even tell the named species of Hippoptera apart informed how I decided I wanted to name any new species. We've already seen some evidence that a well-allocated species name can remain unchanged for, well, ever. And in a hundred years' time, 
my name was going to be less than irrelevant to the student entomologist facing the same conundrum, trying to remember one name out of a million possible species names. I wanted them to be able to look at the organism in their hand and be reminded, kind of like a mnemonic. And this is actually already very common practice in taxonomy. So the first species I named was Hiboptera lucida, in the middle of the top row, and I named it after the two pale patches on its wing covers. They're not actually pale, they are transparent, so I named it lucid, which is clear in Latin. And now it's next in line there to Hiboptera dilutor, the palest, most diluted species in the genus. But there are so many species that need names, this is far from the only approach. For instance, my supervisor, whilst naming 300 of the 600 named species of the genus Agra, started writing jokes to entertain himself on that long journey. You can see up here agrophobia, <laughs> agracadabra, <laughs> aggravate, aggravation. He was also bilingual, so he named agradable which means nice in Spanish, and of course is a much more appropriate language to be naming South American species in. But you can see here how every scientist has a group of experiences, a background, a history, a philosophy, which is being woven into our scientific product. The countries that we come from, the languages we speak, the communities who surround us are being put into our scientific practice. And in the same way, it reflects our strengths, woven in are also our weaknesses. I was satisfied with my personal philosophy to name every species in a practical and helpful way, which is probably why I made a mistake. I was incredibly surprised when my supervisor named a species after me. This is Hiboptera shasta. More than just surprised, I was utterly taken aback and I forgot that that name, the name I'd fought other children in the schoolyard over, isn't just my name. Shasta is taken from the Shastan group of Northern American Indians from what is now Northern California. Most people first come across the name as it is associated with Mount Shasta, a landmark which was named by the same colonists who persecuted the Shasta Indians off of those lands and many of them out of their lives. I could have changed the paragraph that links Hiboptera Shasta to the intern working on the project, but I didn't. I didn't see a pathway forwards. And it might sound like a pretty trivial footnote in the taxonomic literature, and I guess maybe I agreed with you because I didn't make that change. Until I learned that native languages, local languages, have been explicitly excluded from taxonomy since the rules were written. Even more so by the unwritten rules. The societal norms of the 1700s that said that non-European languages were barbaric and unfit for the scientific discourse. Those racist beliefs are perpetuated in modern taxonomy as taxonomic traditions and native languages and local species descriptions are noticeably absent from the record to this day. So yes, not tying the name Shasta back to the Shasta Indians felt like a mistake, one that still bothers me today. So you can bet that it was a mistake I wasn't going to make a second time. The next species I had the opportunity to name was this charismatic cockroach from the central highlands of Tasmania. They are the colour and patina of beaten bronze statues. They're flightless, which is quite common in the Alps, so they run around on the ground. And because it's cold, they come out during the daytime and bask in the sunshine. These are not your creepy under-the-kitchen-fridge variety of cockroaches. It was also destined to be a simple solo project for a fledgling scientist like myself because they were already well-known as unnamed and clearly fit into this group. Polyzosteria from mainland Australia. And I learned a couple of really interesting things about this group as I was diving in to this project. When I say well-known as unnamed, I mean really 
really well known. The first specimen entered the museum in 1941. So people have been taking notice of this species for over 80 years, picking it up, showing it to their friends. Recently, this means more and more and more social media photographs, people wondering what its name is for over 80 years. The next interesting thing we discovered was when we combined their biogeography, their current location, with their DNA barcodes in answered a really interesting question. How did a flightless cockroach get onto an island? <laughs> so during glaciation, Tasmania is a peninsula of southeastern Australia. And the nearest sister species from lowland southeast Australia would have had free range to walk wherever it willed. But then the glaciers melted, sea levels rose, and a population was isolated on Tasmania. It was 10,000 years ago that this last happened, so in that time, that isolated population has become more and more unique, become an individual species, and crucially for us, a species that needs a name. Now, it's only been a couple of minutes since you heard about the naming of Hippoptera shasta. So forgive me, it's been several years, and I honestly considered naming this species in Latin for a long time. It would mean that it matched the other 15 species in the genus, and it would also mean that I didn't have to take responsibility for making change. But I kept thinking about all of those community members who had noticed it, fishermen and hikers who'd picked it up, taken photographs, showed it to their friends. And I was thinking about the land bridge that allowed animals and people to walk to Tasmania during our glacial history. It finally dawned on me, I wondered how many Palawa, Tasmanian Aboriginal people, would have noticed this species, picked it up and shown it to their friends in nearly 40,000 years of cohabitation. Far from being unnamed, it dawned on me, prior to colonisation, there were 16 or more Aboriginal languages spoken in Tasmania. So this species wasn't unnamed, it would have had more than one Aboriginal name in the past and I was in a position to see that it got one again in the future. So I reached out to the Tasmanian Aboriginal community and the Palawakani language program. I told them what I've just told you, all about this species, habits and personality, and I asked them if there was a, a word in the records, a description or a colour that clearly fit the bill. The record is quite fragmentary, so there wasn't an obvious name. We agreed that Yingina, the dual name of the Great Lake, which forms part of the cockroach's territory, well, that'd be a great name for a cockroach. This is called naming a species after its type location and is already actually very common practice in taxonomy. So common that there are already some Tasmanian insect species which have Aboriginal place names as their species names. Much like Mount Shasta, though, some of those place names were designated by colonists, being misspelled, misunderstood, even misascribed in their geography. So Polyzosteria yingina not only received a Tasmanian Aboriginal species name, but one that was given to it by the Tasmanian Aboriginal community. And that might be a first. Well, soon after the publication of this paper, I learned about another species with a similar story a pygmy pipe horse from New Zealand. Isn't it cute? This is Silex tupare o manaya. Now, that Maori translates to the garland of the manaya, which means both seahorse and also a seahorse-shaped, godlike ancestral being. So not only has Silex tupare o manaya been given a very beautiful and complex name in Maori, what is most remarkable is the naming authority. Short and Trinsky are scientists, but Ngātiwai are iwi, a tribe. And this is the first animal whose naming authority includes an entire tribe of people who speak the language that it was named in. Now you're seeing what I saw. I could have done that with Polyzosteria yingina. Palawa certainly deserves to be in the naming authority, but given that that was a world first, 
I didn't have an example from my community to follow. I made another mistake because, as I've been trying to impress upon you, scientists are equally as capable of making mistakes as any other kind of real human person. <laughs> but in the same way, we're also open to continual improvement. In fact, it is the greatest strength of science. It was designed to continually progress based on the influence of new information. And that information can come from lots of places, including you, my community. The protests that you attend, the content that you create, the conversations that we've had, are all filtering into my worldview. They're being channeled down into the scientific record for that entomology student to find in 100 years' time. So yes, I made another mistake. But you know that it's a mistake I'm not going to make a second time. <laughs>